to be in his presence this morning. It is also good to see your smiling faces. We're glad that you have joined us today. Well, we have students that will be attending senior high and middle school camp coming up in the next week and a half. So keep them in prayer and all that will be going on on the campground. Our first Sunday potluck is coming up on July 2nd. So you're welcome to join us for that. And we are viewing The Chosen Season 3 on Wednesdays during the summer. So you are welcome to join us at 7 o'clock for that or come and have a sandwich with us at 6. Well, this morning as we do begin to worship, would you stand and we hear the word of the Lord for his people today. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness is to all generations. May the Lord bless his word. Good morning and welcome. Let's pray together today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather in your house, together with your people, to praise your name, to worship you, to study from your word, to gain strength and encouragement, to become more like Jesus, so that when we go away from this place, we will be equipped to love like Jesus loves. Today, I pray, be with us. Holy Spirit, come, give us the strength we need to worship our God well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in the spirals, y'all, so make sure you've got one of these nearby or share with a friend. And we're starting with page 80. Page 80. A country where no twilight shadows deepen. An ending day where night will never be. A city where the storm clouds cannot gather. Oh, this is just what heaven Standing and 
us we see the face of Jesus before whose image other loves all flee turning to page two. Page two. Probably a little more familiar. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we are astounded that you allow us to participate in your work in our world. You partner with us, creatures, broken, but you do. 
And so today we ask, as we bring gifts to your house to do your work, that you would bless those who bring gifts, that you would bless these gifts, that you would help us use them to do your will in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're finishing up with page 10. Page 10. Day. And if you are here 
and you are three through sixth grade, ages three through sixth grade, you are dismissed. Miss Michelle is waiting on you. Kind of looks like some people are anticipating church is going to be fun, which is an okay thing. Good to see you all. Greet one another. If you feel like it, stand up, shake a hand, you know, stand up. You get to stand, stretch your legs. As we turn our hearts toward prayer this morning, I would ask that you would remember those who suffer everywhere from war and fighting and violence. We see it in our news. We see too much of it in the news. Keep those situations in prayer. Pray for our leaders, our, those who serve us in the armed forces. Pray for those who serve us as law enforcement agents and first responders. Pray for Dorothy, a friend's mom, fighting cancer. Continue to pray for Reddick and his health, for Brenda and Cindy and Bailey, for Carly, Scott, for Andy and Betty Jo, for Edna, for April's friend, April. Pray for April as well. Keep Shelley's father in your prayers. We ask that you would uh, remember a new friend of mine, Zoli, fighting cancer, are there others that you would mention to us today? My cousin Sarah had a couple of cancer spots removed from her cheek and her thyroid, and then she's got another one on her tongue that she's got to also have removed. Continue to pray for Crystal's father. Pray for Miles. Unspoken prayer request you just might want to indicate today. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful for this gift of prayer, communion with the God of the universe. We don't take it lightly and we give you thanks that you listen when we talk with you. I pray that we would have ears to hear when you speak to us. Today we do pray for those that have been mentioned. We think of those in our world. We see faces, we see scenes of destruction. We think of those who suffer from natural disasters and war in its aftermath. Feel powerless to change those things, but we pray somehow for more peace and less war. Pray that you would guide our leaders, those of this nation and the nations of the world. Pray for our soldiers and sailors, our airmen, those who serve us as Marines and in the Coast Guard. We pray for our law enforcement agents, for our first responders. We pray that you would be with them as they take care of us. We pray for Dorothy and her needs, for Reddick and his needs. We pray that you would be with Brenda and Cindy. We pray for Bailey and Carly and Scott. We ask that you would be with Andy and Betty Jo with Edna and April and her friend April, for Shelley's father, for Crystal's father. We pray for Miles that you would touch him, 
we'd get good results from these tests. We pray for Sarah. We pray that she would recover and that this treatment would clear her body of cancer. We pray for Azoli. We just ask that you would touch him and be with him. For the unspoken prayer requests that have been brought to your house this day, we trust you. We trust you with our lives, and we trust you with the lives of our friends and our family. And so we come before you today and we lay our burdens at your feet, and we trust that you can do more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And so I pray that you would help your people to go away from your house today unburdened, because they've cast their cares upon you and know you care for them. And then when we see your hand at work in our lives and our world, we pray that you would remind us to give you praise, to thank you for doing your good will in our world and in our lives. Today, I pray that you would be with us as we study from your word, speak to our hearts truth that would help us to live daily as followers of Jesus, becoming more like him and spreading his love to the world around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, find the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, to be exact. Romans 5. I'm going to guess that's at least two-thirds of the way through the book. Maybe more than that, three-fourths of the way through the book. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Therefore, since we are justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That word occurs many times in this passage, that word reconciliation. And for all the accountants in the room, I'm sorry they're not talking about what you do with your checking account. But it's not far from the definition. Reconciliation. Reconciliation is this idea that two parties who were aggrieved, who had a broken relationship, Two things which were not in agreement, maybe even in opposition, have been brought back together, brought into agreement, brought back into a state of being on good terms, from a broken relationship back into a right 
relationship. And that is one of the chief benefits of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We sang about the atoning work of Christ today and those songs, those old songs that talk about the blood of Jesus being shed on the cross of Calvary. That blood was shed for you and for me, that blood of Jesus, which somehow makes atonement for your sin and for mine. Somehow, through what Jesus did on the cross, the two, humanity, you, and God, can be brought back into a right relationship. And Paul, in writing to the Romans, has in the first few chapters of the book of Romans laid out for all who would read it the fact that we, in our natural state, are separated from God, that the relationship has been breached, that it's no longer good, that we because of our own willfulness, our propensity, desire to go our own way and to go our own way, to do those things which seem right to us in total disregard for what God, our Creator, might have meant for us, that we find ourselves in a state of broken relationship with God not right relationship with God. And I wish, I wish that I could just sort of not have to expound on much of the sin side of this equation, but I sort of feel like we don't always talk about that very much, and people don't necessarily walk around with the idea that my relationship with God is not what it should be. But that is the natural state of a human being. That is the state of an unforgiven, unregenerate person who has never put their faith in Jesus Christ. Not a pleasant thing to think about. The God of the universe and you not having a good relationship. I sometimes hear talk about this topic, the idea of sin or depravity or lostness of humanity, and the reluctance to speak to that condition. You know, people don't like that message, okay? I, I agree, I don't like it either. It just happens to be the reality. And there's so much about the goodness and grace of God for us to concentrate on. There absolutely is. I plan to get to the grace of God in a big way before we finish today. But at the outset, we need to acknowledge that there is a need in the human condition. A need for salvation, a need for God's grace, a need for the broken relationship to be healed for the wrong relationship to be put right, we need to have our sin and selfishness dealt with. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a broken car fix itself. Ever seen one? Change its own flat tire? That day may be coming, but I've not seen it yet. And even when it does, that'll be some device that does that. Broken people don't fix themselves either, by the way. It just doesn't happen. Some outside force is required to come and to heal the broken relationship that exists between us and God. To deal with what's wrong on the inside of us that makes us want to act in opposition to God's will.
Praise the Lord. God has come. God has come in Christ Jesus to do exactly that. He's come into our world to address our condition, our brokenness. And he's made it possible through Jesus' life and death and resurrection for the broken relationship between us and our creator to be healed for the two who are at odds, the two that are not the same, to be brought back into right relationship. And this is accomplished in your life and in mine by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith. It's another one of those words which can have so many meanings. We, I fear, in the English language, very often hear belief when we say faith. Or when we read faith, we hear believe. Those two words are related. But I don't think they convey the intent of the writers of the New Testament when they say that we're to put our faith in Jesus. Michelle and I were driving down the road the other day, and you know this is a strange thing when you get two preachers in the front seat at the same time. Y'all do understand Michelle's a preacher, right? Ordained and, and, and really quite a good preacher. Maybe I should just let her preach and I should go to doing children's church, but your children are far too important for that, so y'all will just be stuck with me. We're driving down the road, and we're having this conversation about faith and about how to communicate this idea. These are the kinds of conversations that take place between two preachers who live in the same house and drive down the road together. And trust, I love the word trust. And I really, really wish that I could find a word that I could substitute for faith that wouldn't mean belief and that incorporated the concept of following. So I've just decided I don't have that English word. The closest one really is trust. But I don't have that word, so I'm going to stick with every time you hear faith in the New Testament, would you please hear faith and following? Believe and follow. Would you just, when you read that, just believe and follow? Because there's a, a response component to believing in Christ in the biblical sense of faith. The idea that your life will be different when you put your faith in Christ. When you believe that he is who he said he was, the Son of God, and that he died for you and was raised to new life, resurrected from the dead, all of these things. Now, I don't know if y'all understand how much of a I like to figure out how it works kind of person I am. Right? When I was two, I found out that with a screwdriver, I could take electronic things apart. I'm not sure that all two-year-olds do this, but... I mean, what makes that cassette tape go round and round and round? And if you leave me alone in a room by myself for about five minutes, I get a hold of a screwdriver and figure out I can take the screws out of a cassette player and examine its inner workings. Long before I have a sense of how to put it back together again, right? What really is scary to me is that I can remember doing this. Remember taking, I don't know, it's so long ago, do, do y'all remember what cassette tapes were? Some of you may not, cassette tapes. We used to have them in our cars. It was after the 8-track revolution, which I barely remember, but cassette tapes were all the rage. And you could put so much on them. 
They were these little tapes. They were kind of like CDs, for those of you who don't know, because we could store music on them. And you could play them. And we had this lovely little portable cassette player that I'm sure my father was not happy about me tearing apart. Luckily, he was an electronic engineer, and he knew how to put stuff back together, which I eventually learned some of from him. But I don't actually understand the mechanism of faith. That's a strange admission from the pulpit, isn't it? It's just the truth. What I do know is that I know in my life there was a time before believing Jesus was who he said he was and determining to follow him. And there is a moment where I made a choice to believe and follow Jesus. And without figuring out the mechanism, I changed. There was a perceptible and immediate change when that moment of faith happened. Now, for me, it was long enough ago that it was an old-fashioned trip to an altar and a good set of crying, praying, getting a lot of things off of my chest and believing. One, that if I confessed my sin, Jesus would forgive. And experiencing the change that happens when you put your trust in Jesus and ask him to forgive you and choose to follow him. And I stood up from that altar a different human being. I still look the same. Sorry, salvation didn't improve my looks any. But I was different. And I was different in this way. There was something inside of me that wanted to please God. That wanted to figure out what God wanted and do that. I wish I had a screwdriver to take the case apart and figure out how it works. Then I could tell you about the power source and the windings of the motor and the little wheels and pulleys and things that turn and maybe do a better job of explaining. What I know is when you make a choice to believe and follow Jesus, you change. Your life is different. And the longer you follow him, and the longer you keep to choose believing, the more change takes place. We have big words. We use words like justified. And I have some fun ways of remembering those. Just as if it never happened, there's justified for you, right? God is taking your sin and as far as he's concerned, it's like it never happened. The slate has been wiped clean. We could quote a scripture that says, as far as the east is from the west, he cast your sin away from you. You're separated from that which separated you from God. He's made it go away. He's taken care of it. You've been justified. And you've been reconciled. This breach in relationship, this brokenness of relationship has been made right again. You've been brought back into a friendly state with God instead of a state of being antagonistic. This happens 
Not because you're able to fix yourself, but because God, in his love, has loved you and sent Jesus. And you get a hold of his grace. God's love poured out for you. Great. And we have this hope when that happens, right? We have this hope of future glory. Paul mentions it to the Romans. The idea that I've been saved, my sin has been dealt with, I've been justified, I've been reconciled to God, and now when I die, I go to heaven. The hope of glory. And I have to tell you, there are moments in life when that hope is strong. The idea of future glory. When a loved one dies, when you say goodbye to a father or a brother or a child, and you have this hope because of their faith and following Jesus. Maybe in the case of a young child, this hope that God's grace is sufficient for that one that never reached a point where they could decide. That hope of glory. But Paul just mentions that and moves on. And he ends up saying that even more Even better, wow, is that something for him to say? Even, even more than the hope of glory is the new life we have in Christ. He's going to go on and expound that more and more in Romans, by the way. But he hints at it here as he just sort of moves past the hope for glory. And he says there's this new life available to us through what Christ has done. And that's even more. I'm scratching my, my head going, how? How is that even more? But then I think that is my experience. That's my experience in this world. That that far off hope for my loved one's for myself, there are times, there are moments when that hope breaks in and is palpable and real. And But then there's all the other moments of life. Those moments that we find ourselves here today experiencing. I'll wake up tomorrow and have them all over again with work and a week and all of those things. And in the day to day of believing and following, I experience the more that I think Paul is talking about. And that more is that every day, in every moment, there is a reality to following Jesus that gives me strength and hope and power for daily living and the ability to cope with the situations that come my way and to deal with life and to deal with disappointment and to love other people, even if they aren't very lovable. Most of you are very lovable, and maybe that's why I love you so much. But a lot of life is sandwiched in between those realities. I'll give a nod to the fact that Paul has this interlude. about our boasting and our sufferings. 
he says, and not only that, the hope of sharing the glory of God, but we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. No Father's Day comes around without me thinking about the lessons only grief teaches. I didn't get to call my father today and say happy Father's Day. Many of you did not as well. And of course my son did not call me and wish me a happy Father's Day and never has. Suffering produces endurance. We have these experiences in life, be it loss or grief or sickness, all forms of emotional, spiritual pain. People disappoint us. Other expectations in life, careers, job, all of these disappointments, financial setbacks, The fact that we can't count on our body quite the way we did 10 or 15 or 30 years ago. This suffering, all of these various sufferings, provide an opportunity for us to reach deep into the reservoir of God's grace, his love that has been poured into us through the Holy Spirit. And when we reach deep into that love, we find an unending well of strength and hope. And it's not just hope for forever. It's hope for today. Because there are moments, right? There are moments of pain. I don't ever wake up on Father's Day and at some point not have a moment of pain. But it's a moment. And it passes. <laughs> and then there are those beautiful relationships. Maybe somebody gives me a call and tells me I've sort of been like a father to them, whether they're my child or not. Maybe I speak to key men in my life who also have been fatherly to me, even though it's not my biological father. I'm reminded that I don't have to, I don't have to live at the point of suffering. I can live into the hope that I find in the love of Jesus. Faith, belief, and following. And no matter what life brings, I keep believing and following. Sometimes that looks like endurance. Sometimes that feels like suffering. And sometimes, praise the Lord, it's most of the time, it feels like hope. It feels like blessedness. It feels like goodness. It feels like the love of God in my heart through the Holy Spirit. Not just for me, but poured out 
on me to spill out onto other people. Hmm. I don't know about you, but there's not much that makes me feel better than being able to express love and care for someone else. It's not a bad coping skill, by the way. It's just not. I don't mean hide from your pain, hide from your grief. Never will I recommend that. I'll always recommend endure, suffer, acknowledge it, let it come, and let it go. And every chance you get, love somebody else with the love of Jesus. Because that's a recipe for hope. And that's a recipe for life. That's a recipe for truly living. Because once you've been reconciled to God, once that primal relationship has been restored, and you and God are on friendly terms, do any of you know the line? Me and Jesus, we be mates. If you don't know it, just watch one of the Crocodile Dundee movies. It's not a bad line. Me and Jesus, we be mates. And if you and Jesus are friends, and you can reach into that deep well of God's love that is Jesus Christ, you can draw strength for today, for you and your sufferings to endure where you find yourself and you can find extra to pour out on the people around you here's an odd odd thing the better you get at reaching into the well of God's love that has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit and pouring it out on others. The more life you will have. You know, I don't mean youthful, vigor, life. I mean meaningful rich, deep life that sustains you and strengthens you, that makes you one of those people that folks look at and go, there is a person of character, all because you have learned how to reach into the love of Jesus and get enough for you and enough to share. And so maybe I say again, Happy Father's Day. May you know this day the blessing that comes from the only good Father. The love that he has shed abroad through the blood of Jesus. May you believe and follow Jesus so that you know the love of God poured into your heart through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And may you become skilled at reaching into that well of love, drawing up enough for you today and enough to pour out onto those around you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, today we give you thanks that we know you as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has come into our world and lived and died and been raised from the dead 
so that we, once far away, once lost and broken off from the very source of life and goodness, can be reconciled, brought back into a right relationship where we can receive grace and love through the gift of your Holy Spirit. Today, how I pray that we will be faithful ones, those who believe and follow, learning to harness this great gift of grace, the love of God poured into our lives so that we might live full lives, lives filled with the joy of God's Holy Spirit and so full of the love of God that it pours through us on to a world of people who need your love. Bless now, I pray, those who have come into your house. Meet a blessing out fit for each one and their needs in the coming days. Dismiss us now with your blessing and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>